Jerusalem and Tel Aviv with bitterness and longing. They are the new diaspora, refugees, exiles from Palestine. Many have lived out the years of Israel's nationhood in the squalor of the camps of Jordan and Syria, Gaza, Lebanon. Out of the misery of their sad quarter century, the Palestinians have developed a nationhood in exile, a politics of frustration. They are fueled by anger at the Israelis and disillusioned by those Arab brothers who they fear would abandon them to secure a settlement with Israel. It was these Palestinians, after the Arab rout in the Six-Day War, these Fedayeen who picked up the fallen Arab banner. They vowed vengeance. While the armies of Egypt, Syria, Jordan reeled from their humiliation by the Israelis, the Palestinians began to train again, became the vanguard of a slowly reawakened Arab pride, folk heroes in the Arab world. There was no one unified group of Palestinian refugees. Instead, they splintered into a dozen different permutations and combinations, maybe more. Their politics, their strategies and tactics differed. They were together only in their vow to eradicate Israel and to return to their homes in the land they call Palestine. They had half a dozen leaders. Then one unlikely figure began to emerge from among the rest, pudgy, unshaven, a Jerusalem-born engineer trained at Cairo University, Yasser Arafat became first among equals. He had been in on the beginning of a resistance group called Fatah, which means victory in the middle 50s. Not until the late 60s did Fatah gain a real purchase in the Arab world. By the end of the decade, Arafat took over the leadership of the Palestine Liberation Organization, a group contrived to unify the assorted Palestinian factions. It was the exploits of Yasser Arafat's Fatah that first caught the imagination of the Western press. Operating from Jordan, they infiltrated the Israeli-occupied West Bank and Israel itself. The Fatah fighters swaggered through the streets of Amman, became a kind of occupying force inside King Hussein's capital. Hussein's Bedouin generals warned him of the ambitions of the Palestinians, told him he would have to defeat them in battle if he would survive but he put off the confrontation of Arab against Arab. In mid-September 1970, the hijackers of PFLP, a small group of radical Palestinians who were plotting to overthrow the monarchy of Hussein, diverted three Western airliners to Dawson's Field in Jordan. And there, they blew them up. One from TWA, one from BOAC, one from Swiss Air. Hussein moved decisively against the Palestinians who were using his land as their own. Moved against 12,000 guerrillas and a Palestine people's militia of 30,000 more. for Amman raged a full 10 days. Slowly, the firepower of Hussein's forces, the artillery and tanks, took their toll. Street by street, house by house, the Jordanians hunted down the Palestinians, forced them out of the city back into the hills. Thousands had been killed by the time a victorious Hussein signed a ceasefire with a humbled Arafat in Cairo. It was here that the Black September was spawned in September 1970, at refugee camps like this one all around Amman. The forces of King Hussein humiliated the People's Army of the Palestinians and broke them. And so the Palestine resistance, instead of sharing the government of Jordan, instead of having a long border with Israel across which their guerrillas could operate, the Palestine resistance was in confusion and despair. Out of their black bitterness in 1971, the fanatic group of Fatah terrorists determined to keep alive the spark of the resistance. They struck first in Cairo in November 1971, a vengeance assassination of the Prime Minister of Jordan, Wasfital. They licked his blood on the steps of the Sheraton Hotel where he fell. It was the first exploit claimed in the name of Black September. 
the four young Palestinians responsible were hailed in the Arab world and served no time in prison. In May of 72, four black Septemberists hijacked a Sabina plane on its way to Israel, held the 100 passengers hostage against the release of 617 Palestinians in Israel's jails. Israeli commandos overpowered the hijackers, killed two of them. The hostages were saved. August 72, Black September blew up a Trieste oil pipeline terminal, a skilled, successful effort at sabotaging a main feeder point for Middle Eastern oil flowing into Western Europe. No one was arrested. September 72, Munich, West Germany. Black September stunned the world by gaining entrance to the Israeli pavilion at the Olympic Village, capturing nine members of Israel's Olympic team. The Israeli government refused to make concessions to the terrorists. The Arabs then demanded to be flown to Cairo with their hostages, there to free the Israelis, they said, in exchange for Palestinian prisoners in Israel. The German police set a trap for the terrorists, but their plan failed. All the Israeli hostages were killed by the Palestinians. Five black Septemberists died, three survived. A month later, two black Septemberists hijacked a Lufthansa plane in Zagreb, threatened to blow it up with all its passengers unless the three surviving black Septemberists from the Munich tragedy were released from German jails. The Germans gave in to the dismay of the Israelis and the black Septemberists were flown to an official welcome in Libya. There they held a news conference like conquering heroes. Uh, uh, but we have to know that Israel is our enemy. Israel is, uh, uh, is our enemy, so we have to kill Israel. March 73, Khartoum. Black September killed two Americans and a Belgian. Seven black Septemberists had invaded the Saudi Arabian embassy in Khartoum when their demand for the release of one of their leaders, Abu Dawood, from prison in Jordan was rejected, they killed U.S. Ambassador Cleo Noel and U.S. Charge Curtis Moore. The terrorists surrendered later and now await trial in Khartoum. There have been more efforts by Black September. Some succeeded, some failed. Most of them aimed at freeing prisoners like their leader, Abu Dawood, apprehended while plotting to kidnap the Jordanian prime minister. Uh. Really, uh, Black September, as I know, is not a separated organization. It is a group of people from Al Fatah itself. Perhaps uh, you will find in uh, a time hundreds of Black September uh, people who are ready to make any operation. In other times, you will find tens. Uh, therefore, you can't give an exact number for Black September people. Kamal Nasser, friend of Arafat, spokesman for the PLO before he was gunned down in Beirut last month by the Israelis, told me that Abu Dawood had been tortured or drugged to make that statement. He insisted that the enemies of the Palestinians try to discredit them by labeling them terrorist. It is ironical enough. It is very paradoxical that the whole world is trying to pause the Palestinians as terrorists. While it should be known very well who are the real terrorists in the area. Second, I believe that the world under the influence, mainly the United States, under the influence of Zionism, has been trying to, uh, has been trying to liquidate the Palestinian resistance movement. Personally, I believe nobody can liquidate the Palestinian resistance movement because we are not Black September, because we are a resistance movement. What Kamal Nasser called a resistance movement can more accurately be described as an amalgam of splitter groups sheltered under the umbrella of the Palestine Liberation Organization. There is the Marxist-Leninist Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the more radical Popular Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Arab Liberation Front supported by Iraq, and Saika, the Syrian-sponsored group. But the most influential, the richest, the most respectable is Fatah. And underground, nourished by them all, is Black September. The brains of Black September, the high command, apparently centers in the intelligence arm of Fatah called Rast. 
Abu Youssef, killed in Beirut last month by the Israelis, was a top man in Rast. Salah Khalif, said to be a leader of Black September, is also said to be number one in Rast today. How is a Black September operation set up? Once Rast settles on a target, they select a commando leader. He, in turn, recruits trained commandos who may or may not be Palestinians, though most of them are. They come from various Palestinian organizations, not just Fatah. They operate in a nucleus around the leader. No one of them knows as much about the plan as he does. They are provided with weapons, explosives, money, fake passports, air tickets, and only what information is vital prior to arriving on the scene. Once they have succeeded in occupying their target, as in Munich or Khartoum, they seize their hostages and improvise from there. It is that improvisation, the confusion, for example, apparent in the Khartoum operation, and the lack of an understood political purpose to their terror that has called their methods into question with some Palestinians and with most intelligence organizations in the West. We put the question to leading Palestinian intellectuals. What is it that Black September accomplishes with its violence? Yusuf Saig of the PLO Executive Committee. We received dozens of letters from people all over the world saying, what is it that makes Black September do this and that? What is it you Palestinians want? In other words, the effect of Black September is being felt by the PLO itself now in the sense that people are posing questions about Palestine. What is it that the Palestinians want? Why are we in arms? What is our grievance? Beirut editor, Jahed Kazem. Black, Black September is fighting practically on all fronts, except the Palestinian front. They resent uh, the attitude of some Arab government in seeking any peace with Israel. They feel that the United States is irrevocably on the side of Israel. They feel that Western Europe is not doing enough, mainly because it cannot uh, get away from the American domination of Western politics. So they are fighting all and one. This is why their actions look so desperate. Professor Nabil Shaf. It was the Zionist organizations in Palestine that invented terrorism. Uh, first letter bombs were used by the, 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 the Israelis. The first electronic bombs were used by the Israelis. The hanging of, uh, of people from trees was used from the, by the Israelis. And Israeli gangs of the Stern and Irgun became so notorious in the world. So uh, we feel uh, that uh, one cannot condemn a Palestinian fighting for his country, even if he uses uh, tactics that are not fully respectable by the world measures. But the world doesn't uh, use the same standard looking at Israelis. An episode that shocked the world in 1946 in the same way the Munich Olympic tragedy shocked the world last year was the blowing up of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem by Jewish terrorists. Ninety Arabs, Jews and Britons were killed. The British rounded up the young saboteurs of the Irgun and the Stern Gang. One of the leaders of Stern, now a political writer in Israel, was Nathan Yalinmore. Was not the state of Israel founded in part on the use of terror by Stern gang, by Irgun? Yeah, of course I admit. And it's so? A great, it's a great, but uh, you see, I'm not against terror in itself, but I'm against undiscriminated terror, against, against hitting... Uh, against killing innocent, uninvolved people. Do you think that Black September has a case? Of course. I admit they have a case. I admit that, that they fight for their own independence as we fought in the 1940s. But your, your own Prime Minister, Golda Meir, says there is no such thing as a Palestinian. Well, uh, in 1942, I would be able to quote you uh, many speeches in the, in the House of Lords arguing that there is no Jewish people and no Jewish nation. As they were wrong, Golda Meir is wrong. Because uh, the best identif identification card for people existing is uh, the youth fighting, the organization fighting for its cause, but, but by many means. So you, Special a former member of the Stern Gang, respect the fighters of Black September? Of course I respect them. I know that, uh, yes, excuse me, uh, I would like to use the same methods as they use. 
uh, because they do it differently than we did. We fight, we killed many of, British, of the British uh, constables here, many people of the CID, of the Criminal Investigation Department, but we didn't kill innocent, uninvolved people. The fact is that innocent people die from terror, whoever the terrorist. The Jewish independence fighters, trying to hasten the exit of the British from Palestine and to intimidate the Arab population there, bombed bus stops and office buildings, railroad trains and shopping crowds. The fighters of Stirn and Irgun took a toll of innocent victims that ran into the hundreds. Leader of the Irgun was Menachem Begin, now a member of the Israeli parliament. We took all the risks possible in our lives during the fight. We never left this country. The British were here carrying our pictures by every policeman, every soldier. We took all uh, the risks involved in such a fight as everybody else. But I don't want any comparison, even by dissimilarity between us and the Black September and the Fatah. Uh, completely different uh, stories of a fight, either in the aim or in the method or in the intention. And let us not repeat that sacrilege, Mr. Wallace. It is sacrilege to you. It is. The Black September suggests that they learned some of their tactics from the Stern Gang. I'm sure they learned. I'm sure they learned. But uh, you see, uh, I would like to stress again that uh, the excess of atrocities un is counterproductive for themselves. From this Beirut beach on the night of last April 9th, the Israelis launched a raid of retaliation for Palestinian atrocities. Three Palestinian leaders were gunned down in their bedrooms. The Israeli commando seized codes and records that revealed to them some of Fatah's inner workings, its plans, and the names of its agents in Israeli-occupied territory. The Israelis struck into the heart of Beirut, some said with the connivance of Lebanese and U.S. intelligence, to get at the heart of the Palestine resistance, which had headquartered here in recent years sheltered comfortably in the laissez-faire democracy of Beirut. Beirut is a money pot, a flesh pot. It is Christian, it is Muslim. It is the most Western city in the Arab world. By contrast, Beirut's squalid camp shelter many of the 300,000 stateless Palestinians who took refuge in Lebanon. They have become a law to themselves inside these camps, a state within a state. They run their own affairs here. They raise their children on dreams of the return to Palestine. From the camps come the embittered young zealots of Black September, the Palestinian troops of terror. It was the anger of these young Palestinians that triggered the confrontation between them and the government of Lebanon earlier this month. Why? They accused the Lebanese government of dealing too closely with Israel's ally, the United States, of remaining passive in the face of the Israeli raids. They even charged their own leaders with being faint-hearted. Finally, the anger of the young Palestinians boiled over. And once more, Arab fought Arab in the streets of an Arab capital. Black September in Amman. Black May in Beirut. But this time, Yasser Arafat drew back from confrontation, sought to hold his own hotheads in check, sought a ceasefire. Because if they lose in Lebanon, the Palestinians have no place else to go. An armed truce prevails now. The Lebanese, fearful that the acts of Black September will draw down upon Beirut the armed retaliation of the Israelis. The Palestinians of the camps, yearning for their homeland, vowing to strike again with terror, the weapon of the desperate and the weak. When my son went away, he left his gun with me. Now he is dead, the gun remains with me, rusting, uncleaned. When his sisters grow up, the gun will be ready for them to take their revenge. That is why I keep it uncleaned, as it is.
His sisters ask me why this gun. I answer, this is for you, to revenge the death of your brother, the death of all Arabs, to recover our land. We must liberate our land with the gun. You, generation after generation, must recover our land. The gun will always be with us. Always. Always. <laughs>